concerns, and it's quite nice. This is the value of technology because I meet with a group that most of them live in Australia. Uh, so they they get up on Friday morning, and I'm uh, I'm sitting here in uh, Texas on Thursday night, and uh, they are actually in the winter time right now, and I am quite jealous of them. But uh, God is good. Uh, we pray for His mercy, and uh, we pray for His peace. Like I said, if there's anything we can pray for you about, please don't hesitate uh, to let us know. Uh, for those of you that, uh, uh, since Michael was out sick last week, uh, our, our tech team was also down, so we didn't get to broadcast last week. So just let me let me fill you in on, uh, uh, for those of you that are online, uh, let you know we are going to begin the process of replanting. Uh, at the end of the month, we will... Uh, have our last uh, gathering as Caribbean Baptist Church, and then uh, we will begin the process of replanting. What does that mean? We're going to create a brand new organization uh, and uh, look forward to... Uh, and I will tell you, God is already working. I've gotten about four phone calls from people. Uh, when you call the uh, director of missions for the local association, um, it, triggers, it triggers a few... Uh, a few phone calls. So I've had a couple of guys that are already reaching out to say, hey, excuse me, if you want my help, uh, please don't hesitate to let me know. So uh, I've got, uh, I've been connected with a, uh, I don't want to call him a professional, but an experienced church planter uh, because all of the principles are the same. So he's going to help kind of uh, help us develop a, a solid core uh, leadership team and uh, get the ball rolling. Uh, pretty quick. So I'm um, trying to develop forms of communication. Uh, if you would like to stay involved with this, please don't hesitate. Let me know. Uh, I will get your information so we can stay uh, connected with everybody uh, during this time. Uh, as I said last week during the question session, um, I am still a pastor. Uh, I am not going anywhere. Uh, I will be on a small sabbatical for a few weeks. Um, I just got to, I have to rest for a little bit. I know Michael needs to rest for a little bit. Brother, we're praying for you. Uh, he's been on a, what, 10 day stretch, you said? Starts on day three of 10. Day, day three of 10. Off. So he got, uh, got family stuff, got work. He's, uh, uh, I remind y'all, he's a, he's a working musician. Uh, so if y'all get a chance, Sundays, he's over at Pier 99 on North Beach. If you go uh, if you get a chance, go out there and check them out. Support uh, support local businesses. Support uh, local uh, local music as well. Uh, always always a pleasure to go out and watch uh, go watch and listen to Michael uh, play. So we uh, we always have a good time when we can get out there. But uh, uh, anything else we can do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know. Uh, during all of this, I will still be available. I will still be in contact with everybody. Um, We'll try not to keep uh, keep things stagnant for too long, uh, but yet wait on the Lord and his leadership and guidance through all of this. So as we uh, worship this morning, uh, let us all stand if you're able, and uh, Michael will lead us uh, in worship, and as we uh, go before the Lord in prayer, let us uh, go before God with a thankful heart. God, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you for... Uh, working even when we don't see it. And God, we just, uh, we just praise you for that, Lord. And we just uh, pray that we will keep our eyes open and our ears attentive and our hearts in tune with you. And God, we just praise you, we honor you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. On a heaven way, it's an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross, the dearest and best, for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I cherish the old rugged cross. Till my troubles at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a grave To the old rugged cross I'll live and be true Shame and reproach gladly bear 
And he'll call me someday to my home far away Where his glory forever I'll share So I cling to the old rugged cross Till my troops at last I lay down I'll cling to the old rugged cross And exchange someday for a grill I'll cling to the old rugged cross And exchange someday for a grill A whole lot of years and a whole lot of pain, and it all brought me here. And the river makes the clay wind through my past, trying to find some good that I can't seem to see. Mama always good, and that sun is shining down. Oh, my darker days They're coming to me now As I hear the preacher say In the name of the Son and the Father Can I really leave you? Three feet of water Can't unbreak the laws Straighten out the rules I've been Take the broken dreams Make them all whole again I've been carrying around All the messes that I've made But if you more stitch from now They'll all be washed away and that sun is shining down On all my darker days They're coming to me now As I hear the preacher say In the name of the Son and the Father Who'd have thought I could leave it all? Three feet of wine washing over me, amazing grace, the quiet sings, and now I know what mercy's all about. The sun is shining down on all my darkest. Nowhere to be found All the preacher had to say Is in the name of the Son and the Father Who thought I could leave it all You took my cross so I could leave Three feet of water Three feet of water You know the song You can get into a big debate on whether it's the three feet of water. When you look at John the Baptist, he baptized even Jesus. 
as a symbol. It's us proclaiming this is what we're doing. We have such a good, good father that he gave us a way. Whether it be three feet of water or even for some on their last breaths, just accepting Jesus. Doesn't matter where we're at, what building we're in, who's around us. All that matters is giving it all to God, accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We have such a great, great Father. Who oh, I've heard a thousand stories and what they think you're like, but I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night and tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers. Far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. Show good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are. To you are, and I'm loved by you. To I am, to I am, to I am. Cause you're perfect, and I will love you ways. You're perfect, and I will love you ways. You are perfect, and I will love you ways. To You're perfect and I will love you ways. You're perfect and I will love you ways. You are perfect and I will love you ways to us. Love so undeniable, I, I can hardly think you. So unexplainable, I, I can hardly think as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still in love, 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 love. you're a good, good father. Do you are, do you are, do you are, and I'm loved by you. Do I am, do I am, do I am your good, good father? Do you are, do you are, do you are, and I'm loved by you. Do I am. To I am, to I am, you're a good, good father. To you are, to you are, to you are, and I'm loved by you. To I am, to I am, to I am. Father, we thank you for the day.
We thank you for being that good, good father that nobody, nobody can compare. That you just be with us today. That you just fill us with your love and your spirit. Like only you can. Father, there's so much coming up that we have no clue about. But we know if we watch you, we listen to you. Father, you're going to be that guiding light. We can't thank you enough for being who you are. We just ask that we can continue to learn and follow your expectations and your footsteps. Father, we just love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated. The uh, youngins are going to come up. They're going to collect an offering for the South Texas Children's Home. If you get any spare change, uh, if you don't have change, we do take dollar bills as well. Uh, but we will. Uh, Pass that on to the South Texas Children's Home in uh, support of them as they, uh, uh, they are a uh, family reconciliation ministry here in the Coastal Bend area. And uh, they, uh, they do uh, family counseling, they have jobs for life, they have faith and finances. Excuse me, I had to put my phone in my other pocket. I was sitting on my phone and it was... Pinching off, my, pinch, pinching off the other nerve. But, uh, um, South Texas Children's Home, they've been around for a good while. We've got uh, members that have had some, uh, ha have some deep roots uh, with South Texas Children's Home. They've watched them grow over the years. They've grown significantly over the last few years. Uh, they have a, uh, is an orphanage down in the Dominican Republic, Republic that has a school. Uh, and they, uh, they take care of the kids there. Uh, they help with uh, families transitioning or children transitioning to foster care. Uh, they, uh, they, they house them up there in, uh, at the, the ranch in Pettis. They have uh, house parents that live up there, take care of them just as they were their own children, get them through school, get them all the supplies that they need and uh, all that kind of good stuff. So uh, for, for every penny, nickel, dime, quarter, dollar bill, uh, whatever you send to us. Uh, you can also go online and give to our designated fund, uh, cbc-corpus.com, uh, and you can uh, click our online giving tab there, and you can give directly. Uh, you can give to a designated fund that will pass that straight on. Uh, we don't keep any of that money. We pass it straight on to uh, Stitch. Uh, as, uh, as we do give, we give uh, sacrificially trusting uh, that God will uh, provide. Um, so if you'd like to give to support this ministry, uh, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, is, and I will tell you, God is good. Um, it, was, it was a bit stressful there for a moment. Um, the, the bank account got quite low, but guess what? God pulled through, and we were able to catch up all of our bills and even give me a paycheck this month, so... God is good. So, go ahead, give him, give him a clap offering. Yes, absolutely. God is, God is good. God is good. He, I want to tell you that that's the, the lesson of faith that we learn. And uh, we'll, we'll probably talk about Abraham uh, here in a, in a couple of weeks as well. Because I've been sitting here pondering. I'm like, okay. So I, you know, my family has some deep roots with this organization. We've been here for quite a while. I mean, Tara and I got married here. Tara got baptized here. Both the girls have been baptized here. Um, you know, and, and it's, uh, you know, it, it, it is emotionally, it is, it is tough. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of memories here on, on this, on this property, but we, we take every day as an opportunity every situation as the turning of a new chapter. Sometimes you enter that new chapter not knowing, more often than not we enter that new chapter, not knowing what is going to happen. Um, but it's one of those, as we turn the page, um, we do feel sadness, yes. But 
we can find hope. And as I've been pondering that the last couple of weeks, I'm like, I don't want to spend a bunch of time on doom and gloom because I'm already emotionally up and down enough as it is. And if you've never struggled with depression, I applaud you because the the melancholy days when you have underlying depression, the melancholy days become magnified um, when you when you see the emotional weight of sadness just bearing down on you. You wake up and you have those days and you're like, I just don't want to get up and go. And so I've been pondering that and I'm like, okay, if I'm in this situation, who else is in this situation? You don't have to raise your hand. I'm not, I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but I, I want to I wanna share with you something this morning from the book of Isaiah about turning a new chapter in, in life. And I, tit I titled this message, Watch Where You're Going, Not Where You've Been. Now, that's, that's a bit of a colloquialism. You know, we talk about, you know, people watching down on the ground and, you know, maybe turning around, walking backwards or something like that, and they trip. And well, what's the usual response? Watch where you're going, not where you've been, right? And, and this morning... We're going to look in Isaiah chapter 43, but as we begin a new chapter in the life of this organization, in our own lives, and many of us may be facing a new chapter. Maybe we're facing a new job or a move. Uh, perhaps maybe you've made a major purchase in your life, or you've got a major health issue that you are facing. The possibilities are endless with this. Um, just this week alone, I realized I am no longer 20 years old, which is why I am sitting down today. I, uh, I was participating in a, f a kickball fundraiser, uh, and uh, first, play, first play in the game I was playing, I, I, pulled a, I pulled a muscle in my calf, so I was like, Coach, I'm done. And uh, it, it, was, it was disappointing, to, to say the least. Um, I was really looking forward to playing. I, I love playing ball. And my body told me, slow down there, Spitzer. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've got some other health issues that I, I need to uh, tend to as well. Uh, for, for those of you, you may not have noticed, I have been sitting a lot the last few months. Um, I, I've got a pinched nerve in my back, in my lumbar area. So I am praying. Uh, I do have a good neurosurgeon in my pocket. He's one of the best ones here in Corpus. Uh, but I'm praying that it does not go to that. Um, if it does, I'm praying that it is uh, the microscopic surgery uh, to release that, uh, that nerve. But I, uh, please pray that physical therapy will... Uh, solve that issue and I can get feeling back into uh, the right side of my leg as well. But uh, uh, please know that I plan on using my sabbatical time wisely, um, taking care of some of my health issues that I have been putting off to the side. Uh, I've had a lot of people yelling at me the last uh, few weeks, you know, because I'm like, I, I've just been going and going and they're all like, hey, you know, I know this one guy that always tells me you need to take time for yourself. And uh, I'm like, yes, I know. I am probably one of the worst ones. But uh, uh, as we begin this journey into the unknown, uh, there is a bit of uncertainty. We, we don't know what is going to happen. We don't know what the, what the future holds. But I want to tell you, we can find hope in the unknown. We, we may find ourselves individually and collectively in a position now to actually put our spiritual money where our mouths are. This is it. And, and the, this is the kind of the way we need to approach this, that God is giving us an opportunity to put our words that we say we have faith into practice. And, and I think that becomes a pretty powerful statement than when we can step out on faith and we can trust in God that he is going to do 
exceedingly abundantly great things, we can, uh, you know, we can face change with not as much fear. Change can be scary, uh, but if we trust in God, we trust in his provision, uh, we can go into that unknown with confidence. Um, we can view the change not as something to be feared, but as something that will lead us into a better future. Uh, we always talk about what kind of a legacy are we going to leave. The past is our legacy. The present is where we are now, and the future is where God is going to take us. You know, we view this change not fearfully, but hopefully. Um, will it take time? Absolutely. Um, this, is, this is all in God's timing. And, and this is what we have to understand. We like to control the situation. It's like normal human nature, right? I want to, I want to, me personally, I'm, I'm such a D-type personality. I'm like, I have to know what's going to happen at the end of this. I, I, I've got to know that. And my, my brain literally hurts when I, when I don't know what is, is going to happen. And I see some of you, yep, I know exactly how you feel. Yep. You know, it, it's, it's tough. You know, you, you need that, that plan that my brain says, okay, this is the first step, this is the next step, and this is where we're going to go with this. And standing here at this road, there are so many options available right now that you just feel overwhelmed. You're like, what decision is the right one? And we trust in God to guide us. But I, wanna, I want us to look at Isaiah chapter 43. This part of Isaiah was written to a people that had been held captive in Babylon. So how did they get there? Well, the, uh, the exodus brought the people out of Egypt. They were brought into the promised land. They settled into the promised land. God had given them some uh, parameters. He says, go in, take over the land, but don't intermarry with the other cultures. Okay? Not that God is culturally selective. He is not, but... He, he knew that the pagan cultures would overshadow worship of Yahweh. And that's exactly what happened. They went in, the, the Hebrew people who became the nation of Israel, they started intermarrying with the pagans. And the, uh, they, they started getting into idolatry. And so God would raise up prophets to call them back to worship of Yahweh. And then they said, we want a king. And God said, I am your king. And they say, no, God, we want a real king. He says, I am a real king. And he's like, no, we want a human king. And he says, you don't know what you need. I know what you need, and that's not what you need. And they, was like, they, they, they became adamant about it, and God said, you know this is going to turn out bad for you, right? And so he gives them what they demand, and it turns out bad. They had a string of, of bad kings. The nation eventually splits into a northern kingdom, ten tribes in the north, and then you have Judah and Benjamin down in the south near Jerusalem. And the kingdom is split. It is divided in two. God raises up more prophets to tell them, return, be unified, straighten your act out, and they didn't. So God says, if you don't straighten your act out, you will be destroyed. There are consequences to your actions. And so the Assyrians come in, from the north and they destroy the entire northern kingdom. All ten tribes are completely obliterated. So all that's left is the southern kingdom of Judah. They hung tight for a little while and then they fell into the same thing, idol worship, uh, polytheism, and God says this is unacceptable. Change your ways or I'm going to remove you from the land that I have given you. And they didn't, and they didn't, and so Babylon comes in under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar, pretty much steamrolls all of Jerusalem and takes everybody captive off into Babylon. Babylon is now modern-day Iraq, Is kind of to kind of give you a little geographical uh, reference there. But we get into chapter 43, and we see the hope in the midst of all of this. The people are, are, have been in captivity. They would be in captivity for about 70 years. God raises up Isaiah the prophet to bring them hope. 
the focus of chapter 43 is the deliverance of the people from Babylon. God says, I'm, go I'm going to deliver you, don't worry. Uh, I'm going to take care of you. You've done, your, you've done your crime, you've done the time, I will redeem you. If we look back to chapter 42, it dealt with the blindness and deafness of Israel. And there's a lot of this. You're, you're blind, you're deaf, you're not hearing, you're not seeing what I'm saying. You're not, you're not seeing what I'm doing here. I'm sending you warnings. I'm firing a warning shot across your bow. And, and, and I'm telling you through my prophets, if you don't straighten your act up, this is, there, there are going to be consequences to your action. And he tells them, the prophets would tell them, repent of the idolatry, turn back to God, straighten it out. And if you don't, if you completely walk away from God, here are the consequences. You will be taken from your homes. And he flat out told them, you're going to be taken from your homes if you're not careful. You're going to, the land that I promised you will be taken away from you. Chapter 43 begins with the phrase, but now. It changes the tone for the reader, for the listener, from sadness to hope. There, there's, a lot of powerful, and there's a lot of power in that little conjunction, but it can, be, it can be good, it can be bad, right? But it changes the tone of the reading from, from sadness to hope, hope in the deliverance from their captivity. Imagine being taken away from everything you've known for the better part of your life. Your children, your grandchildren would be born in a foreign land. This is what they experienced. They, their homes were still standing. They were crumbling, but they were staying vacated. If we look at uh, chapter 42, verses, the first part of it there, verses 1 through 7, is the promise of redemption from captivity. In this section, there are promises of belonging to God. You're my people. You are mine. Nobody can take that away from you. You belong to me. There's, there's promises of God's constant presence. He says, I'm always with you. I am with you. Even while you're not in this promised land, even while you're not in your homeland, I am still with you. I still love you. My love for you hasn't changed, but there are consequences to your actions. You will be delivered. These are the promises. Verses 8 through 13 deal with the sovereignty of the Lord. The, the section there focuses on the supremacy of God. God says, I, all, all of these, these other gods that people have built, they're, they're nothing compared to me. I am supreme. I am the ultimate Nothing happens without my say-so in this universe. And then we get to the section that I want to look at this morning, verses 14 through 21. God's going to promise to do something new for these people. God has a plan. He's going to tear down Babylon. He's going to scatter the, the people of Babylon. And God reminds the people here, he tells them that he is the one who makes the way. I'm the, he says, I'm the one who's going to make your way. But there's a catch. The catch is, is that the people have to move forward. So we get to verses 18 and 19, which is what we're going to look at this morning. In this section here, God makes... Let me go ahead and read that real quick. Uh, in verses, uh, chapter 43 of Isaiah, verses 18... And 19. This is what the word of the Lord says. It says, Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to the things of old. Look, I am about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Let us pray before we dig into this. God, as we come before you, as we open your word, Lord, we ask that you teach us. Speak to our hearts this morning, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in this section here, God makes a declaration through Isaiah the prophet that Israel will be redeemed from their Babylonian captivity. 
In verse 14 here, the prophet calls attention to the coming fall. So we back up to 14. It says, this is what the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel says. Because of you, I will send an army to Babylon and bring all of them as fugitives, even the Chaldeans in the ships in which they rejoice. So God says, it's coming. It, it's, it's on its way. There, there, he will make a way for the people to escape. Verse 16 there, the prophet calls the people's attention back to the Exodus. And I'm not talking about the book of Exodus, but for them, the Exodus was a very real event in, the, in their culture. And look what he says there in verse 16. He says, this is what the Lord says, who makes a way in the sea and a path through raging water. That would immediately brought them back to the Exodus, when they are, are, they've got the army, the Egyptian army breathing down their neck and they run up to the Red Sea and they reach this dead end. In, in dramatic fashion, here they are, they're looking at the sea and then they're looking at the, you see the movie playing out in your head, right? Got the chariots, the dust all whirling up behind them over the horizon and they're coming and they're coming and they're all like, Moses, what do we do? Moses, what do we do? God tells Moses, stretch out your hands. And he does, and the sea parts. Right? We all see Charlton Heston standing there on the rock. Right? And they, they cross the sea, but that's the image that he's presenting. He, he makes a way in the sea through the raging waters. That, that's what he's calling their mind back to, God, that God made a way for the people to escape, and this situation is going to be no different. Verses 18 through 21 there, then we see the proclamation of salvation and renewal. And it, it, it is appropriate for the hearer or the reader here to trust in God for redemption. To remember the miracles that he performed in their past history because the, the Red Sea incident was a miracle. But, but what the prophet is saying here is that the past is not where hope lies. See, in the past, they were to see the faithfulness of God. That, that's, that's the point there, is that I, I, I parted the seas for you. I made a way for you. I've done this before. I've raised up judges to redeem you from oppression. I've been faithful. I provided for you all during the exodus, I gave you manna to eat. And even when you complained, I gave you quail up to your armpits, literally. I took care of your needs. I fed you. I watered you. I gave you guidance. A calling to remember God's faithfulness and his unchanging nature. Because that's what it's saying here is that if God doesn't change and he redeemed the people from Egypt before, he's going to redeem the people from Babylon now. That he's going to remain faithful even during their time of cap captivity here. The prophet calls here to remember the past, but don't hang on to it. Because the very same God who brought the people out of Egyptian slavery is going to lead them out of Babylon the past for them was an assurance of the future. You see, the second part of the call there is God is going to do something new for them that will surpass what he had done for them in the past. And that newness was working even as these words were spoken. And in that, we find hope. It becomes very applicable to us. Extremely applicable to us. And, and I, wa I want you to go home with this point. And I know it's a bit long, but I think it's very relevant. Trust in God to do something new even when the circumstances don't seem favorable. I say don't, but I put do not up on there, so don't get hung up on that because it's proper to not use contractions when you write. But we trust in God to do something new even when the circumstances don't seem favorable. You see, God has delivered his people in the past many times over through the Exodus, carrying them back to Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple. He made a way. He delivered the people. 
He made a way for Jesus to come in and provide permanent deliverance, permanent sacrifice. Right? Let's not lose sight of what God has always done for his people. And I I think that's, that's the point here. We look to the past. We see what God has done. Right? I think of the old hymn, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. A heart of thankfulness will cause us to do that. That is a spiritual discipline. Thanksgiving. It's not just a day we celebrate once a year. Thanksgiving is something we do every day. Because we look back on what God has done and we become thankful. God has delivered his people in the past many times. It would stand to reason that because of his unchanging character, God will continue to deliver his people. I think that would be fitting. Now that can be mind-boggling at best. Because we always face the question, how can God redeem some of the most unredeemable circumstances? Maybe you find yourself in a pit of despair, emotional despair, physical despair. Maybe you're facing a life-altering diagnosis. Maybe you have a relative that is facing something very horrible. This last week or so, I had a friend that suffered a major heart attack. He was on life support for several days. I can stand here today or sit here today and say that he is no longer on life support. He is up. He is talking. He's mad because he's strapped into a hospital bed. Well, he's not really strapped in, but he's stuck in a hospital bed because that's his nature. He doesn't like to sit very long. But he's getting back to his, his self. And I'm going to tell you, there was, a, there was a moment when I thought medically, this guy's not going to make it. I'm like, he's been on life support for like three or four days. This guy's not going to make it. And when they, told, when they said that they were going to pull him off of the bypass machine, I prayed, God, do a miracle. And guess what God did? See, God is still working. So how can God redeem some of the most unredeemable circumstances? By creating something new from anything. I think we shortchange God on this. We think of our circumstances as hopeless. But we neglect that God can create something new from anything, even the worst circumstances or something that seems Hopeless. The key to this is trust. And we have to ask ourselves, do we trust in God enough to set out on an unknown journey where we have absolutely no control over the circumstances? That, my friends, is an act of faith. When we set out like Abraham did with Isaac, with no sacrifice, no offering, just being told by God, go here and do what I ask you to do. Trusting that God will provide. This is the call we all face today. You see, the tendency here is to trust in our own history. We say, well, we got us this far. Did we get ourselves this far? We tend to forget what God has done. Look what this person did. Look what this person did. Look what this person did, right? But, but I want to give, give you some principles here that we can take with us. First thing is, do not dwell in the past. Do not dwell in the past. Okay, so there's a call here not to dwell in the past. Understand this. Our past informs our present and can direct our future. But it does not dictate where we are and where we are going. Somebody needs to hear this today. Our past informs our present and can direct our future, but it does not dictate where we are now or where we are going. 
This has two sides to it. First thing, past victories will not sustain. All the glory days, right? Back in high school, I was the all-district quarterback. I was the star running back for my college team. I was the point guard for my basketball team. Um, um, These are just random statements that I'm throwing out. I was nowhere near a basketball player. Not even, I was was a band geek, (laughs) y'all. But you know what? I could play a trumpet. I could play a trumpet and I was pretty decent at it. I didn't win any awards. But I was I was pretty good, right? It is it's good to look at the good times of the past. It's good to celebrate the victories. But understand this, those victories of the past, they they happened at specific times with specific people at specific places. Life continues to move forward. The victories of the past will not sustain us because eventually we become so far removed from that original situation that it no longer can keep us going. Even in the present, we face a different time, different circumstances, and the victories of the past can effectively become irrelevant. Now don't hear what I'm not saying here. I am not saying that your past is irrelevant. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that we can become so enamored with the highlight reels of the past that we begin to long for those victories again and we'll never see those specific victories ever again. I learned I am not 20 years old anymore. I cannot play with a bunch of 16-year-olds and survive. Just saying. It's it's good to remember the victories of the past. It's good to remember the blessings of the past, but don't dwell on those. We We then begin to long for the good old days. I get that. I understand that. Right? Especially with all the rapid change that came because of COVID. It forced us to do a lot of things differently. We do more online shopping now. We do more DoorDash and Grubhub and curbside delivery, right? Stuff we didn't do two or three years ago. We like to get up and go to the grocery store. No. No. We do, we do it out of necessity, right? But what, what I'm saying here is don't long for the good old days because the good old days will never come back. And and that's the call here. Our past victories will not sustain us, but there's a flip side to that as well. Past failures do not dictate the present. Okay? Past failures do not dictate the present. They shape our present, but they do not dictate who we are now. Your past does not dictate who you are right now. Okay? We are not victims of circumstance. We can rise above all of the negative in our past, provided we don't get hung up on it, right? We all make mistakes. We all make bad decisions. If you've never made a bad decision, please tell me what has gotten you to that point to where you have never made a bad decision. I want to learn from you. My past is littered with bad decisions, bad calls. But you know what? They do not have to dictate who we are now because they have shaped us into the person, the people we are now. And they inform on how we move into the future. This is is one uh, section of of text that that really kind of reminds me of who I am, right? Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. This is what Paul writes. He says, not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I have also been taken a hold of by Christ Jesus. 
Brothers and sisters, underline this, highlight it, whatever you got to do. I do not consider myself to have taken a hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. Don't get mired in the past. This is what Paul is, is getting at it here. Don't get mired in the past. I forget what is behind, but not, not completely forgetting. Let it inform who we are, right? There's, there's a healthy balance here. The past can either become our hero or our enemy, or our enemy, if we let it. We can long for the good old days, or we can get stuck in blaming the past for where we are today. What I'm saying here very directly is accept your past. It has made, who, made you who you are, but don't let it drag you down. You see, both of these mentalities, longing for the good old days, getting stuck and mired in the negativity of the past, both of those can be toxic because in either case, the past has become an idol. Oh, I long for such a simpler day. Yes, it was nice when I didn't have a phone in my back pocket and people could get a hold of me 24-7. It was nice when I could just turn on the radio and drive home and not have to answer a bunch of phone calls or a ringing phone or anything like that. And, and I'll be honest, there have been days when I just want to open the window and throw it out the window. Sometimes we need to d disconnect from that. It, it becomes unhealthy, right? And then we long for the good old days. Oh, so much simpler. I remember the days of not even having an answering machine, right? You didn't even know if somebody called you while you were out. It didn't bother you, right? We gain knowledge from the past. We learn from our past, but it is never, ever wise. Hear me, hear me, hear me, what I'm saying here. It is never, ever wise to dwell in the past. See, the past can shape and direct our future, but not dictate it. It doesn't demand that we be this person. So we cling to the reality, this reality, that God will make something new for the future. And this is, this is the good news here. God will create a brighter future. It requires trust, but just as God led the people out of Israel, out of slavery in Egypt, out of Babylonian captivity... By making a way through Jesus Christ to have a restored relationship with Yahweh. Understand this. God can lead anyone from anything. God can lead anyone from anything. If God dwells in you through the Holy Spirit, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yes, temptations can be miserable. The temptation to get lazy is super enticing. I just, I just want to give up. Right? But God can lead anyone from anything, and that, with that comes something new, something brighter for the future. And there's two things here. There's two things here. See God working in the present. See God working here and now. Oh yeah, it's, it, it's easy to see where God has worked in the past, right? All that hindsight. It's 2020, right? But I'm going to tell you, in, in the circumstances you may find yourself in, it may be difficult to see where God is working right now. It can be especially when you're walking through that valley. It can be difficult when life seems dark, when you feel like you're in that emotional black hole. It can be difficult to see God working. That requires effort on our part. We have to see God working. See, here's the thing. God is constantly working even when we don't see him. He's making all things new even as we speak. The, the world may not reflect that, right? And there's, there's a lot to be said about the influence of the salt and the light right now, okay? 
But here it is, okay? God is working in you. God is working in me to bring about a new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, then he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, behold, look, there's a command, the new has come. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. God, is something, God has done something new in your life. The old has passed away. The old has died. We talk about that in the picture of baptism, that we're dead to the old life, that we're raised again to a new life with Christ. You see, God will not stop working in you daily to renew you. Every day is a new day. Every day is a blessing, and I think we take that for granted. We use it tongue-in-cheek. Well, I'm on this side of the ground. Let me tell you something. I've had conversations with people, and this is what was said. You know, we used to say, that any day on this side of the ground was a good day, but I'm not really so sure that that's the way it is. That's a powerful, powerful statement because this life is miserable. We fall apart. Our bodies fall apart, right? And when you're struggling just to get up out of bed, you begin to think, maybe it's not such a blessing to be here. It is. It is a blessing to still be here, but it is more of a blessing to reside in the presence with God. But God, God does not stop working in us daily to renew us. He works in his church to renew the body and the individual members. But here's the catch. We have to pay attention. It requires intentionality on our part. We have to be watchful to see where God is working. Church, I can tell you, if you're not seeing where God is working, you're not looking for God. Sometimes it can be tough. This is a mystery at best. Because I've gone a lot and be like, I just haven't seen God working. Where's God working? Right? <laughs> There's that hindsight. Oh, and I missed it. Right? It was right there in front of me and I missed it. How many times have you looked at that? Have you done that? Right? So if we go looking for something, we're going to find it. If we go looking for God, we're going to find him. You see, and when we see him working now, when we see what God is doing now, then we begin to anticipate a greater future. And this is the last point I want to make here. Anticipate God to do great things in the future. See, logic would follow that if Jesus, going to, if Jesus is going to return and make an entirely new creation, I believe within my heart of hearts that even now he is working to create something new. I believe that. You see, Jesus said the kingdom of God is now. The kingdom of God is here. What does that mean? Is that the kingdom of God has no longer been separated from earth by sin. That because of Jesus coming to, coming to town, basically, living according to God's standard, dying and being resurrected, the kingdom of God is here and now. We've got to grasp this concept. You see, God is doing something new now. And we would do well to anticipate greater things. You see, if God can part seas to lead people out of captivity, if he can provide for all of their needs, sustaining them in the desert for 40 years, it would stand to reason that God will not fail his people today. And God will lead them to something far better than any one of us could ever imagine. Here's the thing. Don't get so caught up in matters of eternity that we forget there's still work to do here today. Yes, the world is in pretty tough shape. There's a lot of pain and suffering and misery going on right now. And it, I'm going to tell you, it is not, I'm going to say this very blunt and very straightforward. The solution to this world is not in the political arena. 
The solution for this world lies in you and me and the body of Christ. You see, when we begin to be changed, when God does something new in our lives, then we begin to affect other people. Now imagine this, and I've run the numbers. If 12 people can be used to change 12 other people just every year, if they do that, then those 12 people change 12 more people. Guess what? The entire world would be changed in just a matter of at least three to five years. The entire world would be changed based on 12 people in three to five years. And we're talking 7 billion people. Right? So in, in anticipate God to do great things in the future. Yeah, this world is miserable, but we cannot, the church cannot resign itself to the fact that it's just going to get worse before it gets better. I, I have a hard time buying into that. I've really looked at the premillennial theology and I'm like, there's a lot of resignation in that theology. Well, it's just going to get worse before it gets better. And then Jesus is going to take his church out of the world. And then, you know, the world's just going to go to chaos and then Jesus is going to come back. I have a hard time with that. I have an extremely hard time with that. We can disagree on that. It's fine. That's, that's not even anywhere near primary theology, right? We can disagree on that. But I believe, I believe this, that God has given his body a job to do. We are here to make a difference. We are here to light the darkness. We are here to preserve the world from decay. And by the news, the church is not doing its job. And I don't mean just this body. I, I, I heard something the other day and it really blew me away. The United States has more churches in it than any other country in the world. And the United States has more social issues than any other country in the world. Do with that what you will. But don't get caught up, don't get so caught up in matters of the future that we forget there's still work to do here and now. In spite of all the misery that this world can throw at us, God can and will work through this body, through anybody that is willing to follow him to produce something far greater than you and I could ever imagine. You see, this new is not the end in and of itself. We have to take care here. We can quickly idolize the new. Oh, God's going to do something new. New, 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 new. All right, don't get caught up in the new, right? Get caught up in what God is doing because God does new things for his glory. He does, uh, he changes things for his glory. We embrace the new. We embrace what God can do with a few willing people to accomplish his will of bringing the kingdom of God here and now. The new is for the purpose of glorifying God, not just to do something new. You see, we get stuck in that rut and God says, here, try something new. Wow, I didn't think we could do that. Look what God did through us. Right? God can use us in powerful ways. So I want to ask you this. Has God delivered you from the bonds of sin? Has God redeemed you from sin? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you believe that today? You see, the redemption that we find from sin, that's not the end. That doesn't give us the, the, past, the past to check out of life. God wants to use you for something far greater than just simple salvation. See, Jesus promised his disciples that they, and I believe by extension, his church and those who follow Jesus today, he said, you will do greater things than I did. Right? I, I want to do that. Right? I want to do great things for God. That, that's, that's what my heart says. Right? The key here is to trust God to lead us. And, and follow that call in our lives. 
individually, collectively as a body. So have you laid your life down? Have you set your preferences aside? Have you looked at the past and said, okay, you've made me the person I am today. Now let me see what God's going to do with that. Let me see what God's going to do with that. Place your life in the hands of Christ today. Follow him. Listen to me. Follow Jesus. Become the change you desperately seek in this world. This is the only way it happens, that we individually and collectively become the change that we desire to see in this world. How do we respond to that? Is there something you're hanging on to today? Somebody you're, you're blaming for where you're at now, maybe it's a relationship gone bad. Maybe it's the hurt of an uh, unfaithful relationship, that's, that's a popular thing. Maybe it's the emotional scars from a physically abusive relationship. That's, that's pretty big today, too. Let me tell you something. I, I pray for you. For victims of sexual abuse, emotional, physical, domestic violence, I pray for I may not know who everybody is, but I pray for you. Nobody should ever have to endure that. But that makes us who we are today. We become stronger people. Right? See, look back and see how far you have come from that. Maybe you're struggling with a, a physical ailment that doesn't allow you to do things. Maybe you're just struggling with age, period. Well, I can't do the things I used to do, but let me tell you something. God can use you in a powerful way to pick up the phone and pray with somebody. I mean that. You may feel like you can't do much, but you can be an encouragement. And let me tell you something. We all need encouragement. I get those texts. Hey, you're doing a great job. I really appreciate what you're doing. Love you, my friend. You never know when that is going to pull somebody back from the edge of despair. How, how does God want to use you today? Have you given your life over? Maybe you're struggling with something today that, that, that you feel like God is, is leading you to do. You're like, God, I, I, I feel like I'm at this crossroads. What do you want me to do? Wait on his guidance as we... Reflect on this. What has God laid on your heart today? Allow Jesus to change your life and be the change you desire to see and that is the something new that God is doing even right now in your life. God, as we each come before you, Lord, we, we pray for guidance we trust in you. Lord, maybe there's somebody here that is struggling with issues of trust. Lord, I pray that you will open doors for them that they can gradually increase their trust in you, Lord. It doesn't make them a bad person. Lord, let them know that they're not bad people for exhibiting a lack of trust. Lord, let them be strong in you. And let them go day by day stretching their faith and trusting in you. God, as we go out, let us be on the lookout for you. Let us see where you're working here and now. Let us not just always look back and say, oh, I wish I'd have missed that. I, I, I'm so sad I missed that. Let us be vigilant and watchful now for where you are working and where we can join you. Lord, give us opportunities to change a life today. God, let us look to the future. Let us see hope and not despair. Lord, we ask that you... Guide us. Give us the leadership we need to persevere through this time. And God, as we walk through life, let us walk with you knowing that you will never leave us nor forsake us. God, we love you. We praise you and we honor you. And we pray all of this in the only name we know how, the powerful name of Jesus Christ, your son, our Savior. And all God's people agreed and said,
Amen. Have a good week. Stay safe, everyone.